So good afternoon to everybody and a very warm welcome on uh, behalf of our team, on behalf of Francesco Pignatelli, he's an action leader and the senior program manager at uh, Joint Research Center, European Commission. My colleague, Lorena Hernandez, uh, project officer at the Joint Research Center and myself, Simon Vrecher, consultant at Joint Research Center, who will be with uh, you today and be, will be hosting this webinar. Uh, with the title uh, Location Enabled Public Services. So maybe before we start uh, to share with you uh, a few details about ELISE. So ELISE stands for European Location Interoperability Solutions Government and is a part of the bigger ISA Square program and the Euro European Interoperability program uh, aiming at providing uh, cross-border and cross-sector interoperability public administrations and the business and citizens. Uh, under this uh, program, there are uh, 54 different actions uh, uh, dealing and tackling interoperability from different angles. And ELISA is the only one amongst them focusing on the location dimension as a driver for enabling the digital government information. Uh, as you can see on the next slide with the, the context of ELISA knowledge transfer activities, uh, also the webinar today is uh, under this activity. We are organizing periodically these webinars whose uh, aim is actually to uh, engage in an agile way uh, with uh, different topics uh, which are relevant to the digital transformation uh, and uh, also to showcase and promote the results of the uh, activity. Uh, so before uh, we go to the content of the slides, uh, I would just like uh, to take the opportunity of the uh, ELISA knowledge transfer activity that is also going on. As you can see on the next slide, so uh, we are performing a uh, survey uh, uh, with the title Evolution of the Access of Spatial Data for Environmental Purposes. So through which we would like to collect the evidence on how to access and use of the spatial data has evolved over the last decade because this is the long study, comparable study with the one that was performed in years ago, and understand the challenges and impacts and benefits. And also the, uh, the, the results can be used then for the inspired directive. So everybody is invited here. There are so any person or organization that are making use of data uh, general. Uh, so we are planning to close uh, the survey, not the end of November, but at the beginning of December. And you, you have also the links uh, of, of the survey. So it really help us here uh, 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 promoting this survey because uh, your uh, say and your uh, feedback here are very important for us. Okay, coming back to the, to the webinar today, so our speakers today will guide us through the topic of uh, a set of the location. Um, uh, uh, location enabled public services. Uh, showing us how the public sector can leverage uh, upon the increasing opportunities. Uh, presented by location enabled services. So Sebastian van der Pele and Lea Itrius, both from Deloitte, Deloitte uh, will present uh, as the current state of play on the location enabled public services and uh, provide information on some uh, uh, best practices uh, of state of the art solution. So uh, what they will try to cover today in the next uh, minutes uh, first, the context of the, and the definition of the location enable, enablement, followed by the opportunities and challenges uh, that are in location enabled public services. There will be uh, some time as well to uh, a bit detail present uh, the, some uh, cases uh, and demonstrate the uh, actual location enabled public services. And at the end, some uh, conclusions and takeaway messages. So, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last part, there will be of uh, course, some, some space room for your questions, uh, for your comments, and of course, for sharing as well uh, your experiences uh, regarding the patient enabled. Uh. Before we start, I would uh, like to invite you to a short poll that we would understand uh, where are you coming from. So, what is your affiliation? So, what kind of uh, organization you are coming from? And uh, uh, 
what is uh, your role? So are you a location data services provider, user, both of them or none of them? So please take maybe 10, 15 seconds to vote. Okay, only one fifth of, uh, of the answers, please. Okay, we have about the half of the answers. Uh, so compare the results. So it's obviously that uh, most of you are coming from the national public administration or uh, private SMEs, and uh, most likely you're in the role of the providers. Uh, on the other hand, also the users are um, also represented. So please, at this point, I will give a floor uh, to Lea. Thank you uh, very much, Simon. So uh, indeed, we will now jump into the content uh, of this webinar. So actually, I will give the floor to my colleague Sebastian to provide uh, some context and definitions of what we're talking about today. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, Simon, and uh, welcome everyone. So yeah, I will give a, a kickstart to the to the presentation. First, focusing on location enablement, the context and definitions. Um, so what we'll first look at is the definition. So what are we talking about in terms of uh, location enablement? So we're talking about location data um, um, that can be used in the, well, for many different services in the public and private sector for uh, mapping, visualization, data analytics, key insights that can be obtained from combining it with other sources, for example, also air quality data, urban planning, mobility, presence of businesses, industry in a geographical area, etc. To, to, to gain uh, interesting uh, insights, etc. Um, and for a definition, I refer to the, uh, to the definition uh, of this year by JRC. Uh, the concept of location enablement or spatial enablement refers to the use of location information to facilitate the realization of societal, governmental, and organizational objectives. And so location enablement is about getting access and to and integrating that location data to in uh, and information to improve processes. Uh, so that's a definition for you. Um, and now the question is, okay, so what does that mean in the scope of e-government services? Um, if we go to the next slide, what we what we have seen in let's say in the past decade is a growing momentum for location enabled public services. Uh, the figure you see on the slide is a figure from uh, e-government benchmark that has been carried out for, for the last 10 years or so. Uh, where we see that public services are becoming more and more digital by default across the EU, uh, also in a cross-border context. Uh, it's clear that um, from, from these measurements uh, that are conducted every year, that there's a steady increase in terms of the digital public services across all member states. Um, and so this digitization also represents a drive to make public services more efficient, more effective, timely, and of high quality, meeting the needs of citizens, businesses, as well as public administrations. Um, which in itself creates a virtuous cycle, right? So more and better, better digital public services that become available, uh, the more users demand these uh, as they are more available and more easy to use. And what the expectation of the average user is also that they are on par with private digital services that they are used to in their everyday life. Um, so for example, another fact from the benchmarks is that more than um, three in four public services are now uh, actually also mobile friendly, which is definitely something that uh, citizens and businesses would expect. And most public services uh, actually have a spatial component. So think about addresses, place names, administrative units, uh, geographic or, or map coordinates, etc. Um, and using existing sources uh, of, uh, of uh, location information um, makes it possible to, to integrate with, with that data and to create new services and better insights for, for, for policy and implementation. Uh, so integration of, of spatial information in the process of public administrations and their interaction with citizens and businesses is essential for actually creating these new um, uh, public services in a, a user-friendly manner uh, that we see popping up. Uh, all over Europe. From a policy angle, this is of course something that has been driven 
for for many years um, by um, by the Commission and by member states alike. So, as part of the the EU strategy for the digital single market, uh, the, the the Commission uh, recently adopted the European digital strategy and data strategy to encourage. Um, the development of cross-border digital public services and the use of data-driven applications is one example. And uh, to ensure the, the wide use of digital technologies, um, there's also the, uh, the, the Digital Euro program uh, that um, intends to, to support the deployment and access to the state of the art in terms of uh, um, yeah, supporting digital transformation. And of course, this is nothing new in the sense that uh, the INSPIRE and Open Data Directives uh, have, have been supporting that over, over the last decade as well. Uh, and have made available um, a number of uh, key elements to, to implement um, uh, these, these interconnections. Um, So we've seen that also in uh, a consistent policy focus in the last decade from the digital agenda to government action plans, et cetera. And uh, more recently, the single digital gateway as well, implementing a variety uh, of uh, digital public services uh, that now need to be made available online, as well as enabling a once only principle. Um, and in the context of INSPIRE and also uh, the PSI Open Data Directives, uh, there's also a recent development where high value data sets will be made available um, uh, as soon as the Commission adopts an implementing act on this, which also includes uh, geospatial data. And of course, uh, the, the ISA Square program uh, has been working in, in enabling interoperability for, for public sector. Uh, in, in also for many years and including 54 actions that advance interoperability as such. Um, and that's a key element in creating advanced and user-friendly e-government services that are interlinked and based on existing information source, sources and also enabling the ones only principle, for example. Um, so there is the European Interoperability Framework and uh, the Observatory at, uh, of the Implementation in, in the Member States called MIFO. Um, and that also is um, uh, reflected in the, uh, in the ELISA action under the ISA program as well, of course, um, where we have uh, uh, the EU location framework as well as an observatory of, of uh, that called the LIFO. And well, the quote that you see here on the Digital Year program is important because, of course, that's a program that will be starting next year. Um, and uh, among other things, we'll aim at um, including the use of geospatial data as a horizontal layer for use in different sectors. So that's that's a bit where we where we're heading, uh, and where the next uh, the next policy focus will be. Uh, then more from a from a technical point of view. Um, essentially, what we're talking about here is using the building blocks uh, that are available. Right? So uh, spatial data infrastructures or perhaps what will be called uh, data spaces in the lingo of the European data strategy. Uh, and the INSPIRE, uh, they provide a supporting uh, framework for, for e-government uh, and a platform for distributing uh, location data based on the infrastructures established at national level in the member states um, and data sharing actions and policies of government agencies that create and maintain that location. Uh, so components are provided that can be used as building blocks for the, the development of location-enabled e-government services. Uh, for example, there are spatial data sets uh, over 34 themes. Uh, there are uh, web map services to visualize data and web feature services to download them and metadata on data and web services to find and understand um, the services to process data, etc. Um, and there are other assets as well, um, for example, making use of location aware technologies, GPS, Wi-Fi and cell towers that can make personalization of services uh, and better services uh, uh, possible. Again, referring to mobile friendliness um, and um, using uh, gazetteer data um, um, is, is also uh, a, key, a key resource here, uh, as well as um, um, uh, APIs. Um, that are becoming more and more available um, to provide access to these kinds of services uh, that are becoming fundamental building blocks for many, many types of uh, public services. So all this com contributes to more user-friendly services based on user-centered design uh, by guiding users um, to the right 
let's say name or address uh, or simplified content on maps and easier navigation, etc. So here the gazetteer is, is, is an important element as a um, which can be defined as a, a register of features of a country, region, con continent, etc., cetera, um, containing information on their geographical position. Um, and so the ELISE action plan, action um, of the ISA program carried out a survey on this and also uh, a pilot, uh, the JRC Gazetteer, um, that uh, confirmed um, that uh, there is a demand for an EU gazetteer to support multinational applications or complement existing national ones, um, particularly for purposes such as emergency response, um, searching for data sets, news items, tourism, cultural heritage site, validating foreign addresses, you name it, uh, many, many different applications um, are possible. Um, and the JRC Gazetteer evaluation that was published in September 2020 showed that um, both data uh, official as well as volunteered sources are complementary and mutually enhanced results can be obtained from combining these data sets. Uh, there's, there's, for example, a best practice from Australia showing that a national address validation system provided benefits such as improved service delivery with the ease of data entry. Um, uh, and reduced keystrokes, uh, a seamless data entry experience across agencies, and access to a verified national address repository. So being able to locate uh, can also improve uh, efficiency for, for example, emergency services or the installation of utilities, reduce fraudulent activity and enable revenue to be collected, so just to name a few, few examples. Um, so that sets a little bit the scene of what it is we're talking about in a policy and also in a technical context. Uh, context. And um, I now give word to Leah to talk about the opportunities and challenges for the public sector. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. So uh, indeed, now that you have um, a bit of an insight to, to the context, I think uh, we can jump into opportunities and challenges for the public sector. Um, so, first of all, um, I would say we see that there are new drivers uh, that are constantly evolving for the adoption of uh, location enablement by, by public sector bodies. So, if you look at this figure here on the left hand side, it kind of depicts um, where we're at. Um, so we have, you know, um, huge developments in software, so web based access, also mobile first, of course. Um, there's the element of people. We have uh, increased map literacy, but we also have uh, increased engagement as well in terms of voluntarily giving up your data, let's say. Um, and that also links to data and the masses and, and velocity that we have, the volume of data that's being generated today, also through volunteer geographic information. Lastly, um, hardware. So we're talking massive computing power, uh, these days and new infrastructures and, and cloud computing and all of this is built uh, or kind of assembled by new procedures that we're developing today, uh, which leads to what we could call a culture that embraces um, the use of geospatial insight in making decisions. Um, so maybe before we jump into the key opportunities, um, just to give you really a key, uh, let's say, typology for which types of services we're often talking about, uh, where we see maybe um, more opportunities in terms of, um, of location enablement. Bear in mind, it's not, it's not uh, exhaustive, this list. Um, but we have, for example, information services, right? So location data can really help um, administrations to make the information on their activities, processes and products um, available to citizens and businesses in a really user friendly um, and easily accessible manner. Um, secondly, there's also contact services, so administrations can use location information really as an effective instrument for allowing citizens and services to contact them. And we really see this as kind of a trend that administrations are, are to an increasing extent using applications based on location information to their citizens to allow them to report on different types of problems in the public domain. Uh, we'll jump into one of these uh, cases later. Um, there's also transaction services. 
which could also be supported by the use of location data. So just to be a bit concrete here, um, an example uh, could be online applications for building an environmental permits or applications for requesting uh, agriculture subsidies um, and the list goes on. Um, we also have participation services. So there are instances where we see that location data can enable the participation of citizens in formulation and evaluation as well of policies. Um, lastly, also data transfer services. So public administrations could uh, use location data to support the exchange and sharing of data with other uh, public administrations. So now, uh, perhaps to, to the key opportunities. So the ones that we want to highlight today is maybe first of all, uh, the potential to improve service quality and performance. So what we would say here is that location insights, uh, when analyzed over time and as well in meaningful numbers, can really be used to make future predictions that can strengthen the quality of public services, productivity, of resource allocation and the development as well of, uh, of preventative policy. So the key here is really that we would argue that, you know, situational awareness, increased situational awareness will probably lead to better resource allocation, right? So an example of this is how new technologies and techniques uh, such as uh, we could say modeling of digital twins can really allow public administrations to simulate and monitor projects and sites in real time. Uh, and this will also improve then overall processes and outcomes. Um, the second key opportunity that we would highlight is that really almost all public services can generate cost savings from smarter use of location data to derive insights um, that inform policy, services and processes. Um, so geospatial visualization, for example, which is essentially presenting complex data, uh, complex location data in an easily digestible way, is one of the simplest steps uh, that you can take to take into account the fact that there's multiple um, interacting and independent factors uh, towards decisions that affect citizens but it's also a way to better measure and target the supply and demand of services in a certain area. Um, for example, here um, government organs can integrate uh, third-party location or geotag data uh, to make their services more cost-effective. Uh, and as we'll see later, um, there are certainly economic benefits of new models uh, take, making use of, of location enablement. Um, so the third aspect is collaboration. So um, we would say that uh, by using location enabled uh, techniques and processes and, and enabling these services to, to, to be developed really allows also public authorities uh, to pull resources and develop innovative approaches. Um, we have actors, which probably most of you know within the open data movement, for example, who really advocate for bringing together public sector organizations along with the with nonprofit and private sector actors um, and thereby also foster uh, fostering ecosystems thinking so for example uh, we could say that anonymized location data from smartphones and social networks um, can allow us to understand patterns of movement in local areas this can feed into traffic management public transport of disaster response or, or urban planning, the list goes on. Um, and lastly, we've, we've also highlighted engage the public. And this is important because there are changes in uh, demographics and rapid technological evolution, which requires really a shift in what uh, public services are delivered, first of all, and how they're delivered as well. So social media and volunteer geographic information plays a key role here uh, as well in informing the planning, delivery and measurement of public services. Um, so an example here is how, for example, citizens can provide real time input to flood warning systems. Uh, they can report on environmental issues or other aspects that concern them. So it can really be a tool to engage the public as well. And um, on that note, now that we've explored uh, the various opportunities, 
let's say for public enabled um, and uh, excuse me location enabled public services um, let's have a look at what are the key challenges to overcome here so first of all um, open data maturity right so the open data maturity report of 2019 um, show that the average open data maturity score of the EU 28 uh, was 66 percent so that increased just one percentage point from 2018 uh, when measuring policy portal impact and quality um, and this is of course an area of improvement if you look at the the image here on the right hand side upper left corner uh, you can see that there's also some disparity between member states in this field so in terms of location enabled new government the initial step is really to make location data accessible right so through different distribution channels um, now this is something that can already be achieved by the establishment of an sdr um, however in order to really use spatial data to interact standardization and interoperability becomes crucial so we've listed this as well as a key challenge right um, but it's of course also a really necessary tool to capitalize on current opportunities allowing systems to speak to one another in very very simple terms um, so the other figure that you can see on the uh, on the right um, lower hand corner um, it's a figure from the location interoperability framework observatories 2020 report and now these indexes that you see um, represent the maturity level of location interoperability implementation in the respective focus areas and they're measured um, against the target state exp expressed in the EU LF blueprint. Um, so overall, what this figure <laughs> essentially shows is that there's room for improvement, right? Especially when it comes to governance, partnerships and, and capabilities, um, but also in standardization and reuse and digital government integration. Um, next on our list, uh, and this is a well-known one, of course, is the need uh, for uh, to ensure trust, uh, privacy, and data protection. So this is really key in uh, the success of Europe's digital transformation. Um, this is both both in the creation of a single market for data, um, and it also serves as a key pillar in the Commission's white paper on AI. Um, regarding public services specifically, the e-government benchmarking report that we've spoken a bit about today highlights that actually citizens might only be willing to, to access online services and share their personal data online when they generally trust their government. Um, and therefore, you know, that's, that's also how they know that they can trust the security of the online service and overcome this absence of face-to-face -face, uh, communication that we might have been used to in the past. Uh, so fostering trust really in all senses of the word is, is therefore key in this regard. Um, our last, last point of the key challenges to overcome is strengthening uh, technical capacities. And this is important, right? And this can be done through uh, knowledge sharing, and the use of available criteria, indicators, and benchmarks for location-enabled public services to really come to a point where we're able to provide these user-centric designs and uh, also, very importantly, um, adopt collaborative approaches. So the LIFA report that I previously mentioned um, actually uh, states that investments in communication and skills currently uh, do not support enough awareness and capacity building to drive um, the types of improvements that we want to see. So on that note, I think Simon uh, has has a poll for us. Yes, indeed. So uh, thank you, uh, Naya, for presenting uh, these two slides, in particular the opportunities and the, the challenges that need to be overcome with um, uh, location-enabled public services. So maybe uh, if you could share with us your opinion about the, the let's say the relevance, the opportunities and challenges that we've uh, explained today. So if you could uh, maybe vote on the both of them. So which of the opportunities you see the most relevant 
uh, have been mentioned, and of course, which of the challenges you see the most relevant. Please uh, select up to two choices for each of the questions. Okay, at this point we will end the polling and uh, share the results. Uh, so when speaking of the opportunities uh, for you are the most important improving service quality and effectiveness, then enable collaboration with other organizations. Uh, next one, uh, engage the public. The other side of the challenges, uh, the main challenges are still standard and interoperability, what Elisa is about. Uh, then the open data maturity, enhancing trust and then strengthening the technical uh, capacity maybe we can have some some discussion a bit later on in the in the question and uh, answer so i will ask you uh, any questions uh, all right thank you very much uh, simon so actually that takes us to the third section of, of this webinar today which is on um, Location-enabled public services demonstrated. So we want to to give you uh, some some case studies here uh, to show you. Okay, now we know uh, the basics. We know the the opportunities and the challenges. Um, how how can this be uh, uh, employed in two very specific cases? So it's again non-exhaustive. Um, but just to give you, first of all, a, a quick taste of some examples of potential application areas, again, um, non-exhaustive list. Um, first of all, transport. Obviously, there's very um, clear links to location data in the field of transport. But let's say in light of, of the increased congestion of, of urban centers, uh, Location-enabled public services can provide key assets and insights to public transport um, and infrastructure. So just to give you some quick examples uh, in route planning and optimization, adopting smart maps and spatial analysis of key uh, infrastructures such as airport, rails and roads. Here, location-enabled public services can really play a key role. Um, secondly, in construction and planning, for example, uh, GIS, so Geographic Information Systems, can really be an essential asset in, in planning operations and conducting maintenance. Uh, we see that state-of-the-art solutions really employing location intelligence, such as, as uh, in certain GIS systems for managing infrastructure, can really boost public works and generate significant savings. Um, so perhaps some examples of this can be how location-enabled public services um, can issue building permits through interactive platforms or chatbots. Um, there's also the possibility to plan, monitor in real time and perform predictive maintenance through new technologies such as digital twins. Um, when we talk about social services here, there's also a wide array of, of examples um but to to give you one there's really um an opportunity to better target and distribute social services through spatial analysis so one example from the uk is how uh, so the government mapped social housing coupled this with the number of people in each unit ba based on tax papers and measured this with floor space and by seeing these spatial relationships, it really allowed them to optimize uh, social housing by better allocating housing units based on the size of the families. So that's quite a basic example, but shows you what benefits can be added there. In the field of the environment, um, we see that public sector services that employ uh, location uh, intelligence for smart waste management, 
Uh, we also have uh, location intelligence solutions for energy efficiency, to mention one. Um, you can generate energy savings for, for public buildings, for example, which can significantly lower overall uh, carbon footprint, which is very important. So now to, that we've just given you some brief, very quick examples, let's dive deeper into two of, two of them. Um, so here, our first example is on locally volunteer data for better services. So here we want to highlight um, the case of Fix My Street. So we chose this, uh, this case study because it's really a prime example, right, of how location data can engage the public, facilitate collaboration, and increase efficiency through the use of, of volunteered location data. So perhaps first, just to give you a bit of background, so this is uh, an open source software provided by My Society. So My Society is a not-for-profit social enterprise, um, and they're working with partners internationally. Now their aim is really to build digital technologies that help people be active citizens across the three areas of democracy, transparency, and community. So some really nice uh, underlying values here. So how does this really work? Um, so it's easy, really easy for anyone to report a problem, I can say so because I've tested it, um, without having um, to direct it to the appropriate authority. So this, um, this platform, Fix My Street, they use the problem's location and category um, and sends a report uh, by email or web service to the department or body responsible for fixing it. Um, and these reports, if I go on to fix my street, they're visible to everyone. So this allows the public to see what has already been reported. They may leave updates or subscribe to alerts on problems that concern them. Um, and this again decreases the administrative burden on both sides as it really helps um, prevent uh, the duplication of reports. <clears throat> so, um, but then also from the de from the developer side, all that's needed is, is a team. Uh, so it doesn't have to be even a public authority that implements this, although I think in most cases it is. So you need a team. You need to download the software that's freely available. Um, you need to obtain boundary data, of course, to be able to define who's responsible for fixing problems where. Um, and you will need the email addresses of the relevant authorities and then you may customize your site and go live. Now they also have a pro version, so Fix My Street Pro. Um, and some of the benefits that they highlight about the pro solution is that you can uh, achieve direct integration into uh, the local authorities backend system. So this makes it a lot more efficient, obviously. It further prevents duplication because it promotes, um, uh, it, um, excuse me, it prompts actually citizens to subscribe uh, to existing problems. And another point that uh, we thought was quite interesting as well is that Fix My Street Pro provides also uh, problem hotspots or heat maps. So uh, local authorities can see what issues are trending where, which can be useful for policy making, of course. Um, from the user perspective, um, the platform and application asks you only to provide an address uh, or upload a photo whose geotag will be used, uh, provide a brief description, name, email address, and there's no verification procedures uh, necessary. So as I mentioned, also any user can really access the, the history of incidents, the dates of the reports, the acceptance from relevant authorities and the closing of requests. So you can follow any, any incident uh, that you're interested in. Um, so what we would say are really the key successes of this platform is first of all, um, it really adopts this collaborative approach, right? And a very user-centric design for those who've uh, visited the, the websites of, of certain cities or, or communes. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and this is really um, 
demonstrated by the, the, the quite big uptake uh, that you can see of this platform. If you look at the image to the right, you see this is Brussels. It's really uh, a platform that's being used, uh, demonstrated by the number of incidents reported. Um, it's also a type of solution that engages the public, right? Um, it also has the potential to really increase efficiency and deliver cost savings, um, especially the perhaps the pro version, but also because it really uh, diminishes um, the bureaucratic burden on both ends. And lastly, it really provides a service where location data is already crucial. Um, it's readily available and it really brings um, added value to the public and the service provider in one go. So that is it for the first case study. Um, now I know that we had um, David Eaton from Fix My Street uh, in this call. But we, had, we had, unfortunately, he, he needed to leave for another meeting, so we could. Right. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, but then we can actually go to the next case study, I think. So the next case study that we'd like to highlight is um, Transport for London, which is really a case study that's about uh, open data for better public services in, in practice. So this is really a, an example of where we see that publishing open data creates this sort of virtuous circle that Sebastian was mentioning uh, that benefits those using and delivering transports in large metropolis. So we chose this because we can see that there's a significant um, economic and social benefits of these types of public private collaborations and sharing of location data. So uh, first, just some brief background. Um, back in 2007, uh, Transport for London decided to make available their data in an open data format. So this means that the data could be um, freely used, reused and redistributed by anyone that could um, support operational service improvements. Also who could uh, support the development of new um, customer facing products and services those who, who could increase transparency and innovation, and lastly, uh, challenge existing ways of working. So how was this done? So TFL um, made available data about its networks through APIs, um, static data files and feeds, and then businesses. Uh, so we're talking uh, Waze, Google, Apple, um, Mapway and many others, um, as well as a large number of academics and, and professional developers partnered with TFL and used this data to create new commercial and non-commercial uh, customer facing products and services. So uh, a benefit of this was that uh, the TFL network passengers and other road users could then take advantage of these new services and products um, to really enjoy uh, a better travel experience. So the insights from the data by these external users were then looped back into Traffic for London and enabled them to, uh, to stimulate new ways of thinking, let's say, um, and in turn then increase the demand for the network and improve overall customer satisfaction. <coughs> Excuse me. So you see um, the figure here on the right that really shows this, this loop that we're talking about. Now in, in factual terms, um, to give you some numbers um, on this, um, we see that first of all, this has generated annual economic uh, benefits and savings uh, up to 130 million pounds for uh, travelers businesses and TFL itself um, by providing open data. So this is an estimate from Deloitte in 2017. Um, and at this time, 80 TFL data feeds covering operational and corporate information across all modes of transport were made available. And around 75% of this data is available via APIs. Um, also interestingly, 42% percent of Londoners use an app 
uh, powered by TFL data in 2017, they mapped that this was, we were talking about 600 apps, so it's, it's quite significant. Um, and TFL also has significant data partnerships, right, with major app developers and digital partners where they made available their data and received back data. And it's actually quite an impressive number. Um, they had over 12,000 registered developers. So um, unfortunately, we don't have the 2020 numbers, but I doubt it's <laughs> decreased. Um, and also, uh, just on the on the note of also engaging the public, right? Uh, there's been a number of hackathons that have been held to engage with uh, the community and uh, and receive feedback. So this is really nice. Um, now, just to to quickly go through the key successes that we see from this uh, approach. Uh, first of all, uh, we see a public-private partnership that really benefits uh, all ends. Right, so TFL receives uh, significant data on areas where they do not themselves uh, collect data, where they didn't collect data, and this has allowed them to undertake new analysis uh, and improve operations. Um, by opening data, TFL is also creating indirect jobs. Uh, so a number from 2017 again was that they were indirectly supporting 500 jobs that would not have existed otherwise. Um, and companies, of course, have a significant uh, gross value added from this data, estimated at about 12 and 15 million pounds. So it's needless to say very uh, significant. Um, second point, as well as increased efficiency. So for the public, uh, we're saving time for road users and passengers. There's better information to plan journeys. And uh, I would say also the ease of traveling is improved. Uh, for TFL, importantly, it reduces their pressure on contact centers while actually at the same time expanding their customer reach. So this is important. Um, lastly, uh, regarding cost savings. So the cost of TFL for publishing open data is estimated at around a billion, uh, no, a million, excuse me, pounds annually. And this suggests uh, really quite a significant return on investment. Um, and it also creates potential cost savings to not have to build apps yourself, actually, or through co-developing with third-party developers. Citizens um, also save costs, of course. These are costs that were previously spent on paid subscriptions of SMS alerts um, and allows them to use free apps with really real-time updated information instead. So those were really the key messages. So on that note, I think I'm uh, already a bit uh, over time. So I will uh, leave the floor back to, to Sebastian for the key takeaway messages and conclusions. Thank you, Leah, for these uh, very interesting examples. Uh, and I think that um, in terms of Takeaway messages and conclusions, those are uh, very telling, of course. Um, but what we've seen in, in, the, in the presentation overall is that, first of all, there's, there's a growing momentum for, for the uptake of location and label public services, and we've seen a bit uh, what, you, what you can do with it. Um, there is more available, uh, and, 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 and the potential to improve existing services and products and to boost the creation of new ones is clearly, clearly there. Um, and second, um, to meet the needs of, of tomorrow, collaborative approaches to design and user centricity is key. That's, that's uh, echoed um, also in the government benchmarks, et cetera, as, 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 a, as a key design principle. And to achieve that, the right prioritization and, and performance indicators uh, must be applied, of course. Um, and third, if we capitalize on the high availability of, uh, of data, as well as software, hardware, and, and, and volunteered information and processes that are um, and there are significant collaborative opportunities, cost efficiencies, as well as service quality improvements to be made. Um, however, uh, together there are um, things to improve, um, particularly the interoperability between, between services uh, and across borders and um, improving the data maturity, focusing on trust and privacy and protection um, in, in policy and strengthening the technical capacities. Uh, to minimize uh, the gaps at the local, regional, national uh, levels, as well as in the cross-border context. 
so these would be the key the key messages um, that we take away and we also thank you for supporting uh, providing your your insights to the polls in this uh, in this respect and i think that brings us to the the questions and answers yes indeed uh, thank you very much both uh, so since uh, we don't have so much time left uh, uh, i propose that we go quite quickly to the question and answer part uh, so maybe just for for uh, to give you a challenge a bit so uh, maybe you have some other let's say uh, services that you'd like to share with us some experiences maybe you would like to discuss uh, also the, the the list of opportunities and uh, the challenges we uh, uh, were um, mentioning before particularly on those one that you uh, wrote it, uh, uh, just to, to remind you about the opportunities, uh, you thought you thought the, your your the result was that improved service quality and effectiveness one of the most important. On the other side, one of the challenges you've seen is uh, the standards and operability. Uh, so uh, maybe there are some questions uh, about the the, the, the cases uh, that uh, Lea presented. Please, the floor is yours. Or well, while you are thinking, maybe I can post some about the fixed my street uh, uh, the representative of this uh, use case is not here anymore your colleagues from the night will be able to answer uh, so uh, it's, it was quite obvious that this uh, from, from the results on the map in the Brussels so it's uh, that this uh, uh, service is quite uh, well uh, visited by the users uh, so, do you have any information? So, how the the, the city administration is uh, capitalizing on that? So, how is is there any connections with the back uh, back end uh, systems and so on? So, uh, are there any information maybe on that? There. Yeah. Sorry, Simon, I, I didn't hear you quite well. Could you repeat the question? Yes, of course. So is there, uh, it, it was obvious on the, on the, on the slides that you showed that uh, the Fix My Street system is quite well perceived by the, by the users. At least that are a lot of uh, uh, inputs uh, from citizens uh, and this. On the other side, it would be also interesting to know how uh, city administrations is actually using the benefits of the system, so how they are uh, connecting uh, with uh, or integrating this system into their processes, into their backend. Uh, are there any information in that? Uh, right. So, uh, so really, what's um, what we wanted to highlight and what I can maybe explain a bit further is that the newer versions uh, of, of Fix My Street. Uh, enables you to integrate uh, their platform into the backend system. So it takes away this whole element of emailing and it allows uh, the councils to better uh, sort and, and target uh, who should fix problems where they exist and use the dashboards live to, to solve solutions rather than having to, to resort to other channels and sort of double, double admin burden. So from what I understand, uh, how they do this is that they, they overlay asset data, such as street lights on the map to, to help citizens better uh, identify or, or place the issues. Um, and this integration really with the back office system creates um, efficiencies, improved efficiencies for, for officers. Um, and they can really generate some, some significant savings through this uh, uh, channel shift. So, so actually, there's uh, more and more uh, demand for the, this type of service from Fix My Street, um, and it's already been implemented. If you look at their website, there's already quite a few case studies uh, for the pro version, so where it's integrated into the backend systems, mainly in the UK. Um, but you know, we have faith <laughs> that it that it might be spreading, seeing how popular it is also in in the city of Brussels, for example. This system running only in the city of Brussels, or it's uh, maybe also on the regional level or on the national level? About that. 
I think in Belgium it's uh, it's implemented in multiple cities, but they run it uh, city by city, and in the UK council by can council. Mm -hmm. But uh, from what I understand as well, the pro version allows you to um, uh, target also issues of, of wider infrastructure, such as highways that go between cities. So there's certainly opportunities to to expand the geographical uh, reach and, and boundaries. Yeah. Any questions from the from the audience, please? Anybody? I actually read an interesting blog recently about the setup of the uh, fixed mastery pro in Lincolnshire and the UK, where where the developers also said, well, we did this completely remote in COVID times, um, given that uh, normally when you would do such an implementation, you would go and visit the different administrations to see how they can how you can integrate with their systems, etc. But they did it fully remotely, uh, based on, on on the cloud-based service that that is provided by Fixed Mastery, which is an interesting um, interesting block there to see uh, how how easy actually it is to to implement it as well. So it would be obviously very useful to to roll this functionality maybe to some other uh, problem areas of CPS administration. Uh, is there any information on that, maybe? Um, yes, indeed. So, um, some from, from the information that we've received, uh, um, councils are also interested in expanding um, this type of service to, to include um, issues such as antisocial behavior. So here we can really also start looking into to new technology, so photo recognition for better categorization, um, also issues of noise, right, and other um, antisocial behavior uh, that can be tracked in real time rather than simply only reporting issues um, in retrospect. So that's that's an interesting development, and, and maybe we'll see more of that. Okay, thank you. So we are close to 3 p.m. Uh, Central Europe time. Uh, if there are no other questions, then I would suggest to the final final slides. So, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, the presenters, so Lea and Sebastian, and for you as participants to be with us today. And uh, I would like to use the opportunity to invite you to the next event to, to announce the event that will be take place uh, the next uh, next week. So in one week time, uh, we'll organize a workshop on the data ecosystem for geospatial data. And that was one of the activities that was uh, performed under the ELISA action. So uh, it's already uh, information about that in join up. So you're uh, kindly invited to join uh, to this workshop and because uh, it will be uh, consistent of three parts of the presentation, panel, and the uh, and involvement of the of the participants as well. Uh, so in any case, uh, uh, follow us on our channels, as you can see on the last slide, uh, on uh, Twitter, on uh, uh, a, a join up uh, page, and uh, the recordings and uh, the presentations of the all our webinars uh, can be found as well on the link. So well, thank you very much and have a nice afternoon and see you soon in the next conference.